Well, hello, everybody. So good to be with you guys again tonight. And I'm looking forward to our time in the, the book of Psalms. So I hope you'll find your place there. Uh, what a great song. I tell you, every time uh, I hear that song, I think of my friend, uh, Laura Dillard. And so, Laura, if you're watching, just uh, want to say hi. And uh, thank you so much for your ministry and music. That reminds me so much of, of you and your beautiful voice as you praise the Lord. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be in Psalm 71. So if you will find your place, and while you're doing that, I just want to mention if you've been thinking about visiting us or uh, joining us here at Coggins Church whenever services reopen, uh, which we think will probably be the 31st of March, uh, then we want to encourage you to contact us that you, so that you can get your free copy of John Piper's book, Coronavirus and Christ. That's our gift to you, and uh, we just want to say thank you so much for uh, tuning in and studying God's Word with us, and uh, we sure hope to get to know you better as time moves on. Love to have you worship with us here as we gather for Christ. Psalm 71, we're going to be talking tonight about redeeming the second half of your life. Psalm 71. So let me read that and we'll jump right in. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I, I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel man. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope, my trust, O oh Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from before my youth, or from before my birth, you are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have been as a portent to many, but you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. For my enemies speak concerning me. Those who watch for my life consult together and say, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there is none to deliver him. O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste to help me. May my accusers be put to shame and consumed with scorn, and disgrace may be covered who seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more, my mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of, the, of your deeds of salvation all the day, for their number is past my knowledge. With the mighty deeds of the Lord will I, will I come. I will remind them of your righteousness, your, yours alone. O oh God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. To even, so even to old age and gray hairs, O oh God, do, uh, o God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those who come. Your righteousness, O God, reaches the heaven, the high heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? You who have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again. From the depths of the earth you will bring me up again. You will increase my greatness and comfort me again. I will also praise you with the harp for your faithfulness, O oh my God. I will sing praises to you with the lyre, O oh Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you, my soul also which you have redeemed. And my tongue will talk of your righteous help all the day long. For they have been put to shame and disappointed who sought to do me hurt. Well, what we have here in this psalm is a beautiful psalm of the Psalter who has grown old in the service of the Lord. Uh, he has served God for many years, and now in his older years, he 
uh, the insecurity and so forth has come down on him and he appeals to God to continue to protect him from his enemies, to not cast him off, to continue to be his rock and his salvation throughout the remaindering, remainder years of his life. And so uh, we could say with Psalm 70, 71, we have this, this study of how to redeem the second half of our life. Though many fear it and fight it, old age still manages to creep up on us, doesn't it? It seems that we are young, then we feel young, and we fight to be young, and then with no warning, we wake up and somehow age has caught up with us. It has arrived. Why do some look at growing old with such dread? Uh, that's not hard to answer, though, is it? We, we fear losing the youthful looks. We figure uh, our, our youthful figure. We, we fear losing our strength. We're anxious about maintaining our health and growing, and the, uh, we're anxious about the growing inabilities and insecurities that come with becoming older. The, in, the incentive to fear old age is the troubles, the problems and the insecurities that accompany it. That's an easy answer, isn't it? We we understand that. Um, The psalmist has grown old in the service of the Lord. And now in Psalm 71, he addresses God with his anxieties about getting older. And so let's look together. Uh, The first thing I want us to think about, and this is what the psalmist uh, is really, this is what's the burden of his heart, and that is the trouble with aging. We see that uh, really in verses 9 through 11 is the the heart of that section. He says, Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. For my enemies speak speak concerning me. Those who watch for my life consult together and say, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there is none to deliver. You see, all these years... David has lived for God. David has fought for God. David has walked with God. And the whole time, enemies have been on his uh, heels. But, you know, David felt like he was young, he was strong, his faith was vibrant, and so fear was not his companion. But now, as his strength wanes, as his body fails, he begins to fear, and he sees that his enemies see the weakness in him. And they say to themselves, God has cast him off. Seize him. In other words, the time is right. He's finally tired. Age has caught up with him, and it's time to make a move. You know, we fear losing our youthful looks and figure and strength. We're anxious about maintaining our health and the growing inability to do what we used to do. The incentive is clear, isn't it? And, you know, what is the trouble with aging? Well, you know, it's, uh, David is clear about that. He says it's, it's failing strength. Failing strength would be the first thing that we, we would see here. In fact, uh, one author said, We can't hear as well as we used to hear. We can't read the small, the, the small print. We get tired faster. We don't even sleep w- w- uh, well when we do sleep. And we wake up three or four times throughout the night. It was what David is talking about. This is his fear. Do not cast me off, he says, in my time of old age. This is what... David is writing about. Do you know a little bit about a few years? Then you know what what that writer was talking about. Uh, you know, we take a pill to get up and take a pill to go to sleep. We take a pill to do everything, don't we? Uh, it seems like our bodies just don't seem to work like they once did, and and so age uh, is catching up. And with that comes a lot of insecurities many times. Uh, and it will increase our, uh, 
anxieties about walking with God and doing the work of the Lord. So the trouble with aging, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to just, if you, if you would allow me, just a little bit of a sidelight here on the observation in the American culture. Uh, you know, sadly in America, the older population is not revered uh, as they once were in our society. But uh, as a society and culture, we have tailored everything to the young and, and uh, have not taught the young to cherish the experience of the elder, of their elders. I think that's a detriment to our society. That's a, that is definitely a criticism of our society. Um, and it's oftentimes uh, grows out of greed and a desire just to manipulate young people who do not realize they're being manipulated. Often our media and pop culture have done worse than mistreat the aged among us. They have simply forgotten them, pacified them in order to marginalize them. And I think that's a terrible dishonor and injustice to the, uh, the more experienced in our population. It's both immoral and it's stupid, quite honestly, uh, to ignore the wisdom and experience of those who among us uh, who are older and have lived life, especially those who have lived life for God. But enough on the cultural commentary. I don't want to spend our time on that. I want to encourage us about living for God in the second half of our life, redeeming the second half of our life. What, what of our needs at, in, as we've aged? Everyone ages. Everyone grows old. I know that comes as a surprise to some, but everyone ages, everyone grows old. It doesn't matter what science fiction movie says. It doesn't matter what cosmetics and beauty things are made available to us. It doesn't matter about the wonders of science and medicine, and we're grateful for them. We grow old, and that is not going to change. A part of the burden of getting, up, uh, of getting up in years is that our strength begins to wane. Little by little, in body and soul, we feel the drain. This sense of loss of strength brings with it a sense of insecurity, and the psalmist worries that God might abandon him as his strength has left him. Another thing that we see in the trouble with aging is that old problems remain. Old problems remain. Look in verse 10. For my enemies speak concerning me. Those who watch for my life consult together. You see, you, you see that David had been plagued his whole life by enemies. And we oftentimes think that when we get older, our problems go away when the opposite is the truth. Uh, oftentimes David has observed that old problems have not gone away. The enemies still assault. The family problems haven't been solved. Health issues only grow worse. And finances only diminish. You see, the trouble with aging is that still problems still remain, don't they? We don't age out of problems. We don't come to some golden years where we just live carefree and there are no more problems to face in our life. That's a myth. And David uh, recognizes that. He understands that in his old age that the, the enemies are still there. The problems are still there. There's still things to be dealt with in the family. There are still needs. There's still financial needs. His health is waning. His strength is waning. His time is waning. And, and so we see that old problems remain. The last thing I want to mention about this is that loneliness oftentimes becomes our companion in old age, in the latter years of our life. Dr. Montgomery Boyce, uh, James Montgomery Boyce, who... Uh, again, has been a great blessing to my study in this. Uh, I, I emphasize that only to give him credit. I, I believe that all that I'm giving you is mine, but at the same time, I believe his commentary is a wonderful blessing to anyone who would 
uh, would take the time to read it. Dr. Boyce sums this well when he writes that our golden years, uh, in our golden years, we are often alone with no help. And I would say to you that, uh, you know, this is so true. I observe it pastorally. I've witnessed it through family members and friends. And we see that dear family members have passed. And many a friend have retired and moved closer to be with family who could help care for them. Others have sadly passed and died. Growing old can be very lonely if we're not intentional, if we're not intentional about starting new relationships and staying connected to communities. And so we realize that as we grow older, why is David calling out to God? Why is David filled with insecurities and fears? And so therefore he asks God to help him in this great hour of need. Well, it's because growing old is, quite honestly, one of the hardest things that you and I are ever going to do. And uh, David is calling out to God for the second half of his life. When we're young, we fantasize about uh, becoming elderly. We, we believe that, young people often believe that the older population no longer have problems and challenges. The truth is radically different. In reality, we do not age out of any of our problems. The, no, the nature of problems tends to remain static. They do not go away. That's the trouble with aging, isn't it? Uh, we say golden years, but oftentimes uh, they're, they're not as golden as we might want. Um, and you could easily say, well, Pastor, that's a pretty grim description you just gave. Uh, well, I didn't give it. That's uh, clearly from God's Word. And I believe it's also clearly demonstrated from, uh, from practical life experience. But I want you to understand that they, obviously the study doesn't stop there. Neither does David. In Psalm 71, he continues and he talks next about his confidence for the rest of the journey. He talks about his confidence for the rest of the journey. Now for this, I'd like for us to, to bump up to verses 5 through 7. We really could go all the way to verse 1, but to narrow it down, verses 5 through 7 give us the, the kernel of the idea here. Now I want you to notice that 5 through 7 is where J David starts this psalm. He doesn't start his psalm like I have with my message on the trouble with aging. He starts his psalm with confidence for the rest of the journey. Then he goes into the problem. So David's not writing this from a defeated standpoint. I only present it that way so that we might feel the urgency. We might see clearly what David was, was dealing with. Uh, and so logically I have moved it and arranged it in a way that you and I, uh, all these centuries later, could process the message that David is giving us here. But the truth is, David's not coming at this from a pessimistic standpoint. David's actually coming at this from a t standpoint of faith. He's saying God is going to redeem the second half of my life. And he starts, that, he starts out the psalm in verses 1 through 7, or 1 through 8, saying that. So let's jump in. I want, you to, I want us to look at 5 through 7 just to pull out that concept. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from my birth, from before my birth. Notice that, before my birth. You are He who took me from my mother's womb. I have been as a portent to many, but you have made, you are my strong refuge. Well, aside from the fact that uh, those that might argue that uh, a baby in the womb is just tissue, David was not tissue here. Uh, he recognizes he was a human being and God was already sovereignly at work in his life before he was born when he was born, and in his youth. And uh, so I, I don't want us to miss that critical point. But perhaps we're right to fear growing old. 
But the dread of aging is only justified when our hearts uh, and our hopes are set on shallow things like appearance and popularity. The psalmist is real about the problem. He faces the issue of growing older with stark trust, trustful, I'm sorry, truthfulness, stark truthfulness. On the other hand, he is not pessimistic about the second half of life. Oftentimes we are, aren't we? As we face the second part of our life, it can be intimidating. Uh, we can begin to get discouraged as things begin to happen. David sees that growing old has given him a great gift, the clarity that comes with experience. Age tends to burn away the dross of false hopes and shallow dreams. It does, it does this through the processing of experiences through the lenses of God's Word so that he is, he, the result is that we see that only hope, the only hope we ever had was in God Himself. You see, when we're young, we trust in God, but we a whole lot trust in ourselves. But the older we get, the more that experience and sin and the battle of the walk with, of faith uh, burns away the dross of sinfulness and shallowness of false dreams and selfish idealism begins to burn away, we begin to realize that the truth is God was our hope all the time. It's just now in our older years, we don't have the false securities that we once did. God is still our hope. And He is still the one who can bring us through this and give us a hopeful future. So what do we do about the confidence? What is our confidence? What do we learn from David here? Well, the first thing we see is that you trusted Him in the first half, now trust Him for the second half. And that's kind of what we just said in verses 5 and 6. David says, Upon you I have leaned from before my birth. You are He who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. David realizes that God was sovereignly working in his life before he was born. He recognizes that God was sovereignly working in his life after he was born. And he recognizes that he's walked with God sovereign, and God sovereignly worked in his life throughout his younger or first half of his life. And he says, I will continually fill my mouth with your praises. And so what, what can you and I pull from that? Well, the truth is that we trusted God the first part of our life. Now it's time to trust Him for the second part of our life. David expresses his confidence in God's sovereign care over him through his youthful years. Now as he is older, he demonstrates uh, to walk by faith the remainder of the way home. It is no time to lose faith now that he is elderly. Now is not the time to come up with a new plan, as it were. But now is the time to determine to finish well, to double down on trusting God and His Word for the remainder of our life. And you see, this is the key, isn't it? Because as we grow older, we grow weaker, as David said. We lose strength. We lose. We, many of the problems still remain, but we don't have the strength to deal with them. We don't seem to have as many people around us. Many of our family or friends or loved ones and companions are, are no longer with us for one reason or another. And so the temptation would be to forsake God in the second half of our life. When that's the time, remember, here's our... Redeeming the second half. That's the very critical time that we have to hold true to the faith that God gave us in Jesus Christ. Because this is the testing ground. And in many ways, it is the proving ground. The second thing we need to think about is God has made your life or my life a warning and a wonder to others. 
All this youth and experience has made our lives a warning and a wonder to many others. Look in verse 7. I have been as a portent to many, but you are my strong refuge. Now the word portent uh, is uh, similar to our word sign or an omen. And it can be bad or good. You know, a sign would be, you know, probably a good thing. An omen, uh, we would say, is sort of like a bad thing. And, and this Hebrew word has that idea. It can, it's a sign or an omen. It, it's a, it, it means that there's, there's uh, from the standpoint of understanding reality, it's either a, warn, uh, you know, a, a sign of something good or a warning of something bad. Now, some would take this that uh, if, if we take it the bad way, it's saying, you know, look how troubled David's life has been. It's a warning. Don't live like David or your life will be like that. I don't believe that's what it means. Some would take it in the positive way and say, oh, no, it means a sign. In other words, look at David and his great testimony and you'll see that this is the way to serve God. But I don't believe that's the way to take it either. I think it's, it's, this, this word has this concept of good and bad for a reason. If we look at David's life, we see a man who had many struggles. He had failures. He had great victories. What we see is a man who lived life for God and His glory. We see a man who endured great hardships who also experienced great victories. He has believed God through them both. He has experienced the judgment of God and continued to trust God. He has experienced the blessings of God and continued to trust God. That, beloved, is what we call, and what Paul calls in the book of Romans, experience. Experience. Experience is not just made up of good things. Experience is made up of many hardships, many times failures, but it's also made up of blessings and victories. And from that, from those failures and confessions, those depending on God's, God in the dark hours of resting in God's truth when we didn't know what was going to happen, right up to those times when we believed God and, and God came through and everything looked just right and God got all the glory and we, everything went the way we expected it to. All that stuff, the Spirit of God melds together and burns inside the life of the mature believer. And, they, and it produces a healthy, strong faith believer who walks or stands in the refuge of God, like David says here. And so the others are able to look at this person, at David, and say, look at David's life. We see warnings, you know, don't count the people of God when God says not to. Don't do these sinful behaviors because look at the cost it will have. Don't, don't manage your family inappropriately or look what will happen. Or we see, look at David, the apple of God's eye, a man after God's own heart who loved God and sought God and trusted God against all odds and, and experienced incredible victories and lived for God. David becomes this landmark. He's both a warning and he is a sign for those that trust for all to turn to God and live for him by faith. David says, God, you've made this of me. What's the confidence? We see the trouble with aging. We can't get away from that. The Bible's not a fairy tale book. The Bible is real. It comes and deals with the problems that we really have. But it also says to us, look, God is our refuge. God is my strength. And I have strength for the rest of the journey. The God that carried me the first part of my life will carry me through the second part of my life. In fact, God's been building up my life to this point. He's made me a pertinent. He's made me a sign, a witness, a testimony of His great faithfulness so that others can see. Then lastly, reaping the harvest of a life 
lived for God. Reaping the harvest of a life lived for God. Look in verses 14 through 18. He says, But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day. For their number is past my knowledge. With the mighty deeds of the Lord God I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness, yours alone, O God. For my youth, from my youth you have taught me, and I stand, I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to those to come. You see, David does have a place. So we say, okay, so it's time to double down at this part of our life. It's, it's time to double down on our trust in Christ and His gospel. So what, you might ask, does this look like? You know, what, what, if we're supposed to double down on our confidence and, and our trust at the second part of our life, what does that look like? How do you do that in, when you're facing, you know, uh, waning strength and remaining problems and lonely times. Well, it looks a lot like these verses. Uh, it looks a lot like uh, verse 14. He keeps, you keep your faith vibrant. You keep your faith vibrant. Look at verse 14. But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. Do you see David's faith waning like his strength has waned? No. David says, I will continually praise you. I will praise you more and more. So we might say his physical body is slowing down. But his spirit is speeding up. His physical body is becoming weaker. But his spirit is growing more and more vibrant in God. The temptation to live in past victories and fond memories of spiritual blessings is is a powerful temptation indeed. But we must resist them. These blessed times do not equate to present blessings. They are old manna, and they will stink to the younger generation and to our grandchildren. The only spiritual life that you will be able to impart to them is life, uh, the life of Christ in Christ now. So what am I saying? I'm saying... You you and I cannot live off the past victories. We can't live... Our spiritual life must be continually praising and growing. It must be more and more. We can't live in the, the victories of the first half of our life and think that we can communicate vibrant faith in Jesus Christ to, the, to our younger generations. And notice David wants to do that. He says in verse 18, So even to our old age and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me. Why? Until I proclaim your might to another generation. Which is the second thing I would say. Target the younger generation for evangelism and discipleship. So rather than the second part of our life is the end of our life because we no longer are strong, our enemies and problems are still there, and we've lost some of our loved ones who have gone on to be with the Lord or have moved out of our life in one way, shape, or form. Rather than, than allowing that to paralyze us, and then we retreat into the victories of the past, we must live with the purpose of a vi- and, the, and the plan of God for a vibrant spiritual life now, and we must have the purpose of winning the, the younger generations that are coming up behind us. And so you have a mission field. 
And that is to reach your children, reach the younger generations around them, reach your grandchildren, reach your great-grandchildren. Do not disconnect yourself with the younger generation. In fact, this brings us to our second thought about which I, I, I call you and uh, to our harvest. And, and that is another failure that we often see in believers as they grow older is to distance themselves from the younger generation. We often feel tempted to distance ourselves from the younger, younger generation. They do this because it's increasingly hard for us as we age to understand the young. As we age, they, they look foolish and irresponsible to uh, uh, so that we naturally pull back from them. We pull back because they are, uh, we're not interested. They're interested in things that we're not interested in, and we're interested in things that they're not interested in. And so it feels natural to pull away and to pull back from young people. Modern times has surely magnified this issue by generation, generali- generationalism, by categorizing, you know, the, you know, this, the, the millennials and the boomers and the Xers and all that. And these might be nice scientific categories, but they are terrible categories for making a cohesive, loving, socially warm society. We must have that. And to pocket everyone in one category or another is to pit them against one another. And it's not healthy. And so we need to be careful, especially those of us who are moving in or already into the second part of our life. We must, un- we must resist the temptation to isolate ourselves from the younger generations. We must push ourselves, be purposeful and intentional about that. We must have a vibrant faith now. What's your faith like now? Are you living off past victories? Do you dwell in those days in the first part of your life when you felt young and vibrant and filled with faith? And now you feel like that you know, you don't have that anymore? Well, I, that's not God's plan for you. God's plan for, for you is that you might experience growing, vital, life-giving faith in Christ now. And when you're experiencing this, this walk with Christ, this deeper walk, this profound spiritual experience, your, your intentional uh, efforts should be toward communicating the faith, the gospel of Jesus Christ to you, the younger generations that you have uh, access to. So that's, that's our calling. That's what, this is how the first part of our life is oftentimes, those are our building years. And many times our influence is nowhere near what we might want. And what we tend to do is get through the first heart, half of our life, and, and as we said before, false hopes and, and uh, uh, shallow dreams burn away. And what do we do? We develop a frown and we sit down and do nothing. When God says, no, I've burned all that away so that you might have a realistic understanding. You've worked your whole life and walked with God your whole life. Now it's the time to reap. Now is the time to take your experience and your vital walk with Christ and reach the next generation before He brings you home to glory and brings me home to glory. So is there purpose in the second half of our life? Absolutely. Is there life in the second part of our life? Yes. And so we need to see that clearly. The wise older believer, though, uh, you know, realizes that this is an illusion and a temptation to pull away from the younger generation, to distance ourselves, to become critics of them rather than disciplers and evangelists to them. It's easy to step back and say, oh, well, they're, you know, they're irresponsible and foolish. Well, anybody can step back and begin to be a critic of the younger generation. What the younger generation needs 
is someone to love them to Christ. Someone to come along beside those young believers and nurture them in the faith of Jesus Christ. That's our calling. That's our, our ministry in the second part of our life. And by the way, that's our harvest. See, we've built our whole life. We've suffered all kinds of difficulties and problems. Why? So that we can get to the, to the second part of our life and begin to use that influence and that experience to evangelize our loved ones and disciple them to live their lives for Jesus Christ and the glory of God. So my dear friend, God is not finished with you. Did you hear me? God is not finished with you. There is great work that remains, and you are uniquely experienced to perform it. There are prayers to be prayed, souls to be saved, lessons to be taught, children to be trained in God's Word, people to be helped, and most importantly, worshipped, Worship to be offered to our loving Savior. And so let's redeem the second part of our lives and finish strong and well for Jesus Christ and our God and His glory. Well, let's take a few moments and have a word of prayer for some of the needs that we have. I know some of you are dealing with some health issues and spiritual struggles. Perhaps even this message has touched a nerve in some way in your heart and you think, you know, you know what, I have fallen into that. I, I have sat down and thrown up my hands like my better years are over and I just need to retire and play the rest of my life or give up. Um, but you realize after tonight that that is not God's plan for you, that God wants you to use all the seeds, to, to reap the harvest of all of the seeds and all of the things that He has done in your life up to this point. And the only way He's going to do that is if we do like Paul said, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you do not faint. So let's pray together. Father, we thank You. We thank You so much that uh, we often face the great trial, the many-year trial of growing older. But we thank You, Lord, that You do not forsake us in, in our older years. You do not forsake us when our hair grows gray, as David said. But in fact, Lord, the time when we think uh, our life might be winding up is the time that you might want to do the greatest things yet in our lives. That you've been building up all of this time to do this, to use us the way you see planned. I know many that are hearing me, maybe they're concerned about their grown children or their grandchildren or great-grandchildren. Help them to see, Lord, that it's not too late. The time is not over. In fact, maybe the time is just right. Maybe in, your, in their younger years, no one would have listened to them. But now, with the experience both bad and good, They've become a great testimony of what it means to know the living God and to trust Him, that He's real, that Christ is a Savior, that their sins can be forgiven, that the life of Jesus is the abundant life, and it's the life everlasting. Lord, we pray like David. Revive us for the second part of the journey and help us to reap the harvest 
that we have built with your grace our whole lives. We pray that this will all redound more and more to your wonderful, bright glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight.